when you played the introduction game on Tuesday, Christopher said, uh, this is what LARP is. Game designers plus world plus characters plus magic circle plus story plus players plus tools. And this day at the summer school uh, is going to be a lot about the tools. The tools are instructions or objects that control uh, how the players interact with the fiction of the LARP and with each other. And tools is a sort of everyday name. It's just uh, an easier word that we use for three different things. Rules, meta techniques, and replacements. Don't panic. You don't need to know these words, really. Uh, you don't need to know which game mechanics belong to which group. That doesn't matter. It's just easier to speak about them if they have some names. Okay? You can call all of that game mechanics. And game mechanics, the word mechanic, it comes from the word mechanism. The idea is that a LARP is like a big machine with a lot of parts that are working together. And game design is when you make the blueprint, you make the instruction for how to build this machine that the players will be together. Again, don't panic. <laughs> you, can say, you can say that all game design, everything that we do when we make a LARP, uh, is game mechanics and rules. Because everything we do when we make a LARP is about instructing the players how do they create this story together. But if everything is rules, then it's very difficult to talk about rules. If everything is game mechanics, it's difficult. So in this Fader talk, when we, and generally when we talk about game mechanics, we only mean these three things. So what are they? Rules. One. Rules are instructions for what the player should not do, and also instructions for what the players should do. And the rules can be explicit, it means that you tell them to the players, or they can be implicit, which is that we don't talk about them, but we kind of know them anyway. Explicit rules in the intro game that you played were that Tuva and Christopher had made a rule that was in this game you can do three things. You can dance, you can talk, or you can be the person who is not dancing or not talking. Right? That was an explicit rule. An implicit rule was, for instance, we stay in Billiardas until the LARP is finished, if possible. We didn't talk about that, but we all assumed that it's true. Another implicit rule was we don't take off all of our clothes during the LARP. <laughs> we also didn't say that out loud because we assumed that in our culture and in the culture of the game probably people are just not going to take off all their clothes, so let, we don't even need to talk about that. But sometimes when you LARP with people from different cultures, the implicit rules are different. In some places you don't touch strangers' skin, for instance, or in some LARP places you always LARP in a specific way, so you have to be aware of what are the implicit rules, and when you know that then you don't need to talk about them. Okay, two, replacements. When something in the game represents something else, for safety reasons, or because it's more practical, or because you want to direct the player's attention at some certain part of the game, so you exaggerate that thing on purpose, you replace it with something else that is more clear, those are replacements. So for instance, for safety reasons, maybe you can have a water pistol instead of a gun, but everybody pretends that it's a real gun in the game, that's a replacement. You can have a name tag, I mean, inside the fiction, the characters know each other and they remember what they're called, so the name tag replaces the character's memory. And it also makes it more playable, because the, the players don't have to spend energy memorizing everybody's names. Uh, and in White Death, uh, which I haven't played, but I'm pretty sure that balloons give the idea of dreams, a physical shape in this game, and that's what it's about. Um, and that means that, that you can focus on this thing that is an abstract thing, you can focus on it in a, in a practical way during the game. Replacements are very often objects. You can also replace an action with another action. But many actions that are replacements belong to this category. And again, like these aren't super specific terms. Don't panic, what's what the category is? But it's just good to know that these words exist. Meta techniques. Big word. Meta, the prefix, I looked it up in the dictionary. It means something that is on another level, or something that involves a change of state, something changes from one thing into another. So a meta technique is a tool that lets you, during the game, change the level of interaction. What does that mean? Okay. A meta technique is a rule that opens another magic circle inside the magic circle of the LARP. You remember a magic circle is a place that has different rules than the everyday world. Sometimes inside the LARP we open small magic circles that have other rules. 
Um, and we typically do this to switch and communicate between the player level and the character level. Okay. So when you played New Voices in Art, you were using a meta technique, that is that you tap the glass and then the, the, you, the player can hear the character's thoughts. Now, the rule in the game was that you act as the player, you say what the player says, but inside the little bubble, when you tap the glass, boom, you open a little bubble, and inside that space, between the players who are in that situation, the rules are different, and then it closes and you can continue playing. Okay. And that one involved a rule and also an object, which was the glass. So, this fader is about game mechanics and how intrusive or discreet they are in your LARP. Intrusive means that something disturbs you or that it draws attention to itself. And game mechanics can be intrusive in different ways. It says volume, amount, style there, but there are no specific words for it, so I'll just explain what it means. Um, a ge game mechanics can become intrusive because they are very visible. For instance, a, a pink, uh, uh, in a very realistic game, a pink water pistol is quite visible. Uh, maybe it grabs the attention, maybe it's something very loud, for instance, that everybody in the game can hear, and maybe it doesn't fit into the fiction of the game, and that's often you do that on purpose, uh, but it's attention grabbing. Uh, a game mechanic can also become intrusive if it's used very often, um, or if it's used in ways that intrudes on the flow of the game. So, for instance, in New Voices in Art, if everybody is only tapping each other's glasses, it becomes very difficult to understand what is happening inside the fiction, because basically it becomes a game about telepathy, almost. <laughs> <laughs> and the characters are, it's about people who are not speaking to each other at all in a gallery, it's just about people who are walking around thinking their own thoughts. Um, if, it, if a game mechanic is discreet, it means that the game mechanic blends into the fiction and the flow of the game. And every game has some kind of, of game mechanic. There are rules in all games, but some of these rules, uh, sometimes they are not visible at all. So many of you have now played Snaphane, and Snaphane is a game that has very, very discreet game mechanics. Uh, most of the game design is hidden inside the fiction, and actually there is only one rule to the players, if I know this game correctly. That rule is that the players know that everything that the characters say is true. Okay? That's the only rule in that game. It's very easy to play. Everything else kind of happens automatically. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not game design in Snaphane. There is plenty of game design. The, the organizers can control the pace of the game, and there is, new, there is a lot of new information entering the game and so on, but that has been sort of hidden inside the fiction. It's handled through characters, and it's handled through the, what the characters know about themselves and each other and so on. And, and the, the, the situation in the game is people talking in a room, and the players are also people talking in a room, so you don't need special rules to handle that interaction. We all know how that works. So it's sort of there in the overlap between the, between the rules and, and the world. This is, a, I mean, don't think so much about the model, it's just to help you think about this. So when we say that made game mechanics are totally discreet, what we mean is that they fit the fiction of the world, both how they look, and also that the actions that they make the players do feel natural inside the world of the game. And a middle level would be, like slightly less discreet, would be that it still fits the world of the game pretty well. And maybe that the other players don't notice. Maybe if I am using a game mechanic, it doesn't disturb the other players. It's just for us who are here. Again, in New Voices in Art, let's say that we were playing it here. If you guys are tapping somebody's glass over there, to me, it still looks like a conversation. I'm just at the gallery. And you guys are using a game mechanic over there, but it's happening very discreetly to me, even though to you it's changing the, the game over there very much. Um, so, but the most intrusive game mechanics, the way they work is that they, they are uh, instructing the player to step out of the fiction so that the world fades away for a little while. Um, for instance, you played When Our Destinies Meet, and in that game, the, the flow of the game, the playing of the game is paused so that the, the, game, the game master can give instructions. That's an intrusive game mechanic, and then you continue. It doesn't break the story, because the brain constructs the story of the parts that have been played, but it intrudes on the, on the flow of the game. But it has very good sides as well. Uh, when in the safety talk, we talked about the hold rule, when you yell hold and you, you stop the game for everybody for security reasons. That's also super intrusive, as it should be. So, I'll give an example, another example, to, to see what kinds of things it can be. 
one element uh, in stories of LARPs that is very often controlled through some kind of game mechanic is conflicts and violence because it's very impractical if the players start to punch each other in the face for real. It's also wrong, probably, and also dangerous. Um, so, first let's take a discrete conflict resolution system. In the Monitor Celestra, the spaceship game, uh, there was a rule system that, that the players for, had um, play toy guns, or, but prop guns that looked real. Uh, and when they, they used them by pointing them at each they didn't shoot anything, but they looked very real. And, and in a conflict situation, you point them at each other. And the rule was, if you have a gun, and the other person doesn't have a gun, you win. Big gun beats little gun. Two guns beat one gun. And so on. So you didn't break. If you were in a conflict, ah, people are, are pointing at the players all think, okay, who, where are the guns? Where are the guns? Okay, we lose. And then you continue playing so that you can lose in a satisfyingly epic way. <laughs> right. That's a very discreet mechanic. It's all happening inside the player's head. But it's still a game mechanic in the sense that, that they are kind of stepping out of the fiction, but you're doing it very fluidly. And if you practice this, it doesn't even feel like you're breaking the game at all. In the middle level is Capo. If, uh, there were, in Capo there was a rule, because the game did, ma masters didn't want a lot of violence inside the prison because of safety reasons, but they had a system where if three people put their hand on your shoulder, you have to follow them if they take you somewhere. It's, it's a little bit more intrusive because it's, it's not realistic necessarily even in the context of the game, but we just say that's just how it works here, and then the players just have to accept that, okay, Maybe my character could get out of this, but the rule is that we're that I'm following. And a super intrusive method we practiced with Tuva when we played rock, paper, scissors. Maybe we have a very sort of realistic, uh, for instance, medieval game. When I started LARPing, this was very common. You have your costume and you're doing all the things in the medieval thing. And then when we fight, we stop playing. We do rock, paper, scissors. I win. We talk about how did I win? Are you injured? And so on. And then we say, hey, everybody, we just had a fight. This is what happened. There, she's injured. I won. And so on. And then everybody continues playing. This is super intrusive. It's uncommon now, but you can use this for uh, these kinds of things. And it, it can be very good design as well. So, if the, if the fader is set to maximum intrusiveness, what are the benefits? And, and one are the, what, are the, what are the bad sides? Downsides. One of the, the key benefits, for instance, in a game like When Our Destinies Meet, which uses a lot of meta techniques, and there are hundreds of more meta techniques that you can use, and you will learn about some of them today. For instance, it can give clear focus to the play. Uh, if, the, if you have a meta technique where you stop the play, the play and say, We all look at this scene now, well, that gives great focus to the play. Uh, Game mechanics can allow very cool things to happen in the fiction that are difficult to do in any way that is not super intrusive. Flying, for instance. I mean, I guess you could have some kind of rig where you attach people, you actually physically make them fly. But I, I don't, I've never seen a LARP where that's been done. If you want characters to fly, you're going to have to have some kind of game mechanic that has to be intrusive. But wow, how cool it is in the story, because they are flying, right? Or time travel or, or telepathy, mind reading, these kinds of things require intrusive game mechanics and it's totally worth it if you want to tell those stories. And of course it can add a lot of safety. There are some downsides. Uh, the most intrusive game mechanics you kind of can't opt out of. So if I'm having some very good play over here and you're launching some big game mechanic over there, you kind of may break my situation. And maybe I never have a chance to get back to that scene and that can be sad for me. It can break the flow of the game and sometimes it can look a little stupid or silly. So if, if you want the game to look very consistent in some very cool or very artistic way, you have to think about that as well. On the other end is discrete. It supports game flow and it supports immersion into character. It makes it easier for me to only think about the character and not so much about the player. It can add plausibility and playability if they are well integrated. So for instance in, in Melon Himmel Hav that Emma spoke about between heaven and sea, uh, you could tell from the clothes of the players if they were morning people or evening people. That made sense, it's logical inside the fiction, but it also means it's like a name tag. I don't need to remember which ones belong to which group. Um, and it can make the aesthetics and the visual style uh, consistent. A downside is that if you're very much always inside the character, it can make it easier, it can make it harder to step out of the fiction for other reasons. So then you have to workshop very carefully your opt-out mechanisms and so on. And it can make safety features harder to see. So if your game looks dangerous and it's very realistic, for instance, 
the police might think that something scary is really happening. <laughs> so that's also something to think about. In many places it's illegal to have real looking guns in the street, for instance. There you have to have an intrusive mechanism so that you don't accidentally get shot yourself. Good design is economical design. Um, that means that if you can do something with one thing, and you can make that one thing do like three things, it's better than to have to put in three things into your game. So if the characters have to wear clothes anyway, why not make those clothes perform some other functions that have meaning to the players, that are other meanings than they are to the characters. And, and that means that I will now say that very often being discreet is actually good design, but not always, and you can do things with the other setting of the, of, the, uh, of the fader that are very, very powerful and very good for your game. So, but you have to consider, consider this. But think about the economics. How many things can you design and how many things can your players remember? If it's fewer, it can make the game more discreet and easier to play. I will leave you with one more slide, which is, um, what's a tankenöt? It's like a, a, a puzzle. I don't have the answer to this. Um, some of you have played a game called White Death, and in White Death, I could I leave you with this: are the rules and the replacements and the game mechanics of this game, everything that's instructing you how to act and not to act, are they intrusive, or are they discreet? I'm not sure, but if you if you design the game, if you use all of the r rules of the game to design the world of the game then it can become very close. I guess it's the perfect discretion, but you, it's not what you first think, I think, when you, when you think about white death. You don't need to know the answer to this question, and the people who haven't played the game yet will think about this tonight and go, I don't know, I don't know the answer to this question. Not all slides are relevant, at, not all of the faders are relevant at all times. All right, thank you very much.